does the way we pray have anything to do with the results we get? So many Christians are praying and praying and even fasting and praying, and they don't see the result equally to the amount of effort they put into prayer. And one day the disciple of Jesus came to him and they said, the disciples of John, they know how to pray. Can you teach us to pray? And Jesus was teaching them how to pray. But actually, through all the Gospels, through all the different stories, it's a, it's a teaching about how to pray. When you see Jesus is praying or Jesus is doing something, notice how he is doing it, what he do, exactly what he says. First, I want to start with a story from Ezekiel chapter 37. And I will just read it. It's very known passage, so you will probably know it. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and he set me in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Verse 7, it says, So I prophesied as I was commanded. As I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says, Come breathe from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. Verse 10, so I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, Your, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and said to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, my people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that the Lord has spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. Isn't this an amazing story? The prophet Ezekiel was commanded to talk to these bones. Uh, you know what prophesy is? Is speaking the word of God, speaking what God has said. This is in the Bible called to prophesy. And most of the time when he's prophesying is about the word of God, we teach the word of God. I'm prophesying now for you. I'm speaking the word of God. You know, in the streets and in house to house, uh, when we do evangelizing, the same principles apply for all these situations about healing the people. And actually, I will come back to that a little. As we walk in the Spirit, we are walking in the finished works that Jesus told us to do. And this is important. Healing is extremely important in the Bible. Everybody that came to Jesus was healed. He didn't send anybody home without he, they were healed. If we come to know and experience the love God has for us, it brings us into a reality that transforms us. Most people that I have seen be healed have also been touched in their spirit. They have understood that this is God, this is Jesus who is doing this. The new covenant God is seeking for you so he can share his amazing love for you to experience. Whether you are listening from YouTube or Zoom, God wants us to experience his love in our lives. In Mark 11, verse 12 to 14, there you can read about the tree that Jesus cursed. The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. 
okay, now they are coming out from Jerusalem. They have been there and we, you probably know the story. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the seasons for figs. Then Jesus said to that tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples could hear him say, it. okay, we go down to verse 20. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. And Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, the fig tree you cursed was, has withered. And then Jesus said, have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if anyone say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done to, for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have already received it and it will be yours. But this about prayer, this is what Jesus are now teaching the disciples. Jesus had faith in God, therefore he spoke to the tree. Without faith in God, he couldn't speak to the tree. And we see the result come from it. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Roman 8 verse 19. Even animals can get healed. I have heard many stories about people, farmers, they had animals and they got sick and they went to the animal, they lay hand on them and they pray the prayer of faith for the animal and the animal got healed. The whole creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to show the glory of God. This is our calling. This is what God wants us to do, to show his glory. God wants to show off. He wants to show the people around us, in our family, in our churches, in, in the streets, in homes, his glory. He wants to show his glory. That is his, his wish and his will. Romans 3.11 says, But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend it to heaven? That is to bring Christ down. You know, we don't need to try to get Jesus to appear from heaven because he is already here through his spirit, also called the Holy Spirit, when his anointed word is proclaimed. Jesus is actually here in his person through the Holy Spirit. When we preach the word of God, Jesus is there. He is the word of God. John 14, 26 says, But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance all that I have said to you. Isn't that amazing? So because Jesus went, he sent the Holy Spirit to us. Acts 1, 8, he said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witness both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Hallelujah. His witnesses of Jesus and his witnesses is to proclaim the kingdom of God. But before we proclaim the kingdom of God, according to Luke chapter 10, we should heal the sick. Jesus said in Luke 10, when you enter a village, heal the sick then proclaim that the kingdom of God is near. So this, this is the priority that Jesus had for us. Mark 16, verse 15 to 18, it says, And he said unto them, Go ye unto all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believe not shall be damned. And those signs shall follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Notice what the last verse here says. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It doesn't say just put your hands on somebody and pray a short prayer for them. No, we pray until that person is healed, because that's our job. So we keep our hands on the sick until they are recovered. Hallelujah. I've done that many times, and I see it works time after time after time. Sometimes I even pray three times for people to get healed. But the main point is that they get healed. So we keep our hands on the sick until they are recovered. 
Our work is not finished before the person is healed. Because Jesus said, heal the sick. You know, sometimes when I've seen that people didn't get healed, I have gone home in tears, asking God, please show me. Show me your glory. 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 I want to see your glory. In Matthew 7, 17, verse 14 to 20. And you know the story, Peter when and james and john went together with jesus up in the mountain and there jesus was transfigured in front of them together with him was moses and Eli elijah but when all this was finished they went down and found this demon possessed boy and his father jesus healed this demon possessed boy from verse 14 he says when they came to the crowd a man approached jesus and knelt before him lord have mercy on my son he said he has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. Then Jesus answers, you unbelieving and perverse generation. So who was Jesus speaking to here? He was speaking to the disciples that did not come with them up on the mountain. How long shall I stay with you? This he said to the disciple. How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon and came out of the boy and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. I want to tell you something, don't get mad at me, but if somebody doesn't get healed when we pray for them, it's because of our lack of faith. It's not because of their lack of faith, because Jesus didn't say, go out and uh, let the people have faith so they can get healed. He told the disciples, go out and heal the sick, period. No discussion, no excuses, nothing. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. Nothing will be impossible for you. All you need is a small faith like a mustard seed, then nothing will be impossible for you. When people tell me you have a big faith, I said, no, I don't have a big faith. I have a small faith in a big God. My God is able. He's able to move this mountain. He's able to heal this sick. He's able to free this person who is, uh, are attacked by spirit, who are demon possessed. I never use a long time to free people from demons because I know my authority. I just to command that demon, leave this person now. You spirit of blindness, go out now. That's what I do. And I see the blind people start to see again. So how can the people get healed today? Jesus is not physically here, but his spiritual body, his church is here. We are here. So now the sick should be brought to us. We actually should announce that all the sick people come and get healed because Jesus told us to heal them. In Mark 11, 27, it says, Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible. And with God means me plus God. Then all things are possible. God himself is not doing it because then there will be nobody who are, who are sick because he feels sorry for everybody. But me plus God, then nothing is impossible. The background is that the disciple came to Jesus in private and they asked, why couldn't we drive out the evil spirit? In Mark 11, 27. I brought him to your disciples, the father said, but they could not heal him. What is a mustard seed faith? Faith like a mustard seed is a small faith that has the potential to become a great faith that will be able to move mountains. If you have that mustard seed planted in your spirit, and if you belong to Jesus, you do. Everybody have that mustard seed planted in their spirit. In Genesis 1.1, God says, let there be, and there was. When God said, let there be light, it became light. And God spoke his word, and it affected the matter. You and, also, you and me are also called to speak the word of God to people so they get healed. God spoke before he acted. So the word had to be spoken before any action will happen. 
When you have somebody sick coming to you, ask for prayer, then you speak healing into their body in Jesus name. You don't try to convince them about faith or anything else. You speak healing into that body because healing have been given to you. Hebrew 11, 3, it says, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were made of things that are not seen. We can't see the result before we speak healing into people's bodies, but we can see it in our spirit, and that is the key. Use your mind, or should I say your um, imagination, and see that person heal. A woman came to me once and uh, she had a, a boy that was 20 something years and he didn't want to believe God or want to follow Jesus. So she come to me and she asked, Michael, can you please pray for him? And I told her, yes, give me your hand. And I commanded that boy to get saved in Jesus name. You, uh, Tom, get saved in Jesus name. Re uh, turn your life around to Jesus in Jesus name. And I told this woman, let us now imagine that Tom have received Jesus and he is standing there with his hands raised up. Let us imag imagine that. And then we thank Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that Tom is saved. I thank you that he's standing there. He's praising you. He's free. He's free from the drugs he's using. He's totally free in Jesus name. The woman went home. She had traveled quite, quite a distance to meet me. The woman went home and three days later, she called me by telephone and she said, Michael, my son received Jesus today. Hallelujah. You know, it matters how we pray. We are not called to, to be beggars. We are not called to beg God to heal this person or do that or do that. God has called us to be partners with him. God has called us to be partners with him. Before you see anything you speak, you need to see it in your spirit. Your imagination, your fantasy is the door to your spirit. Use your imagination when you pray for somebody. Somebody had cancer and uh, her daughter, I, I met her daughter and um, with some other friends and she told me that her mother had cancer. Can you please pray for her? And I said to everybody in the room, let's stand up, hold our hands together, and let's agree that we see this mother standing up from her bed where she was in pain on the way to die, standing up 100% healed in Jesus' name. And when we stood there holding hands, I told everybody, use your imagination. See her standing up in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name, I commanded cancer, leave the body of this woman right now. Melt and get out of her body now, in Jesus' name. All the pain, go now, in Jesus' name. The next day, they called us and said, you need to come and visit my mother. And we came there, and I was very, very curious to see what happened, because I did, they didn't tell me what happened. We sit down and her mother was in her bed like usual. And then her mother stood up from the bed in front of us and said, yesterday when you prayed for me, all my pain left me. My cancer left me. I have now no pain anymore and I can walk like normal. And her daughter told me that that same day, her mother had walked up to the supermarket, bought some food and came home again all by herself. By faith, we understand God. By faith, you came to believe in Jesus. And also by faith, we speak to the impossible and it will be possible. It can happen with the weather, when the weather is bad and you need to travel somewhere to preach the gospel or you need to go for shopping. You speak to the weather. I've experienced that many times and God honors his work. God spoke the word into existence. He didn't work for it. He spoke and his word was the creative power that made the word. Speak the creation word of Jesus. John 1, 1 to 9 said, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. 
In him was life, and the life was the light of all man mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness have not overcome it or understood it. There was a man sent by God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Je just as we first were saved by faith in Jesus, we must continue by faith by raising up what the Apostle Paul calls the shield of faith. It means we defend ourselves again and again by choosing to trust in what God says about himself and ourselves rather than the lies of the devil. Raising up the defensive shield of faith, which is the word of God, is the best and only defense against the attacks of the evil one. Dart by dart and lie by lie, we name the lies and we choose to trust in God's truth instead. When the enemies try to shame you, remember 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. So if you have fallen in unbelief, God is just and he is faithful to forgive. If, he try, if the devil tries to turn your attention towards ambition, pride, or lust, recall Jesus defying him in the wilderness in Matthew 4.4. 4. When God sends his word, he expects you to go. So if you are praying for somebody, that means you're actually asking God, send me to that person, to preach to that person, to pray for that person who is sick. Psalms 107 verse 20, he said, he sent his word and healed them. So by whom did God send his word? When you go outside your church walls and you meet people, you meet people who have a need, you are sent by God to heal them, to meet that need. Don't be shy, be strong. Joshua was told by God, be strong, or by the angels, be strong. So what is our motivation? in all this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 2 it says, if you have the gift of prophecy and can phantom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if you have the faith so that you can move mountain, but, but you don't have love, you are nothing. First, first Corinthians 13 is uh, verse 13, it says, and now this dream remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of this is love. God so loved the world that he took action. He sent his only begotten son. So love and compassion to people is our motivation. When we see somebody that is in hurt, they are sick or they have uh, made an accident or something, we should be moved by love and compassion. Accident happens. Somebody called us and said that a man who uh, have broken his hand in an accident he had broken his hand several places. And the next day he, was, he had an appointment to go for the hospital. And they sent us the photo of the x-ray so we could see it. And we could see on the x-ray that the hand was broken many places. So we prayed for that hand. In the name of Jesus, you bone move together now. Hand be healed right now in Jesus' name. Amen. And... The next day when they went to the hospital, they took an x-ray as they used to do just before the operation. The doctor said, there is no broken bones here. They sent the photo to us so we could see that the x-ray was 100% uh, clear of any broken bones. God has healed that hand. It doesn't take a lot of effort from us, but it takes faith and it takes us. We need to imagine us this. We need to learn how to heal the sick. That is why Jesus say, many of them will come on, on the day and they will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name prefer, perform many miracles. They didn't do this out from the love. They didn't know God. They didn't understand God. They just healed people just by pure faith. The agape love is Jesus in his core. We need to have the same love as Jesus had. We need to see through the eyes of Jesus. We need to understand. We need to feel through the emotions of Jesus. 
We need to be Jesus here and now. Hallelujah. The God for love of Jesus makes exactly that. Love brings out the character and the DNA of Jesus. Love people like Jesus loved people. Ask God so that you are able to see people with his eyes, to feel people's hurt with his feelings. And then you can't stand still. You have to go over to them, stretch out your hand, put on them in Jesus' name. So be bold, be strong. Most of all, be filled with the agape love of Jesus. Be filled with his power. Be filled with his faith. Be filled with his boldness. When Jesus stood in front of the tomb of Lazarus, he didn't say, God, please heal Lazarus, wake him up from the dead. No, he, he shouted after he had said to God, he said, I thank you that you always hear me. And I tell you something, when we go out to heal the people, you can say to God, thank you that you always hear, hear me. Because everybody that were brought to Jesus were healed. I thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you for your power of the Holy Spirit. I thank you that the Holy Spirit lives in me. It lives in my spirit. It lives in my mind. It lives in my flesh. The Holy Spirit is all around me. Thank you, Father, for your word are creating what it says. 